Welcome to the Leaders in Tech video series brought to you by the YPO Technology Network. I'm Stephen Forte, and today I'm chatting with Scott Belsky. Scott's the founder of Behance, chief product officer of Adobe, and prolific author and investor, and Scott, hopefully soon, a YPO member. Welcome. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Hey, so there's so many things I want to chat about today, from your career to your books to your investing experience. You built Behance into a very successful platform and sold to Adobe. For many YPOers, including myself, the journey ends for that company right there. But you've managed to not only work within Adobe, but to thrive, taking from roughly a million subscribers, I believe it was, to over 10 million, and significantly redeveloping Adobe's mobile and product strategy. So first, look, take, take me through the decision in selling Behance to Adobe. Uh, how did the deal develop and was it an easy decision? Because there are all sorts of YPOers who are considering similar, similar transactions right now. Yeah, and I, um, I'll take myself back there and help share a little bit of my thought process. So Behance was five years of bootstrapping, two years as a venture backed business. And over, I would say about four years before we were acquired by Adobe, we had had a relationship with Adobe and a few other companies like Autodesk and LinkedIn. And I always had the belief that I should build these relationships because they were either partners or something more. Mm -hmm. And I remember taking my investor updates uh, in those last two years when we, were, we had a group of investors and forwarding them with some light deletions occasionally mm -hmm. to some of these partners just saying, hey, you know, FYI, I wanted to share with you the latest and it would be good to catch up at some point. And so I was very transparent. I wanted these partners to see what we were working on and, mm -hmm. and what we, you know, the milestones we were achieving and that sort of thing. And, uh, and with Adobe, we actually had two or three false starts where in one case we wanted to um, have, a, uh, have a, a, a partnership with them that ended up fizzling at the last minute. Another time we had a deal that we were you know, being paid to do something to power their own portfolio display platform and that mm -hmm. failed to come to fruition. Uh, and, but in each of these instances, it was never sour. It was always somewhat frustrating, but let's keep working together type of thing. I think that the math for me at the end was three things. One was, would this, um, would, would this be a good thing for the community? Would this be a good thing for the team? And also, what was the financial implication? Um, and when we actually did the deal, it was very clear to me that we were at a point where we would either be acquired or raise a series B and series C and mm -hmm. probably both because of what we knew we would need to do, uh, need to have to make it on our own. And it just, because we had only raised so little money, it was kind of apples to apples when I thought about whether it was a 150 million or so exit or a three to $500 million exit, I realized that with increased market risk and more dilution and everything else, right. it was kind of probably the same outcome financially. And so then the second question was, okay, um, if that's a reasonable, if that's a great outcome and, uh, and a sort of a logical choice to do it now as opposed to later, mm -hmm. um, let's, let's put that aside and think about what's best for our team. Adobe was an acqu acquirer that really wanted to keep us front and center and keep the brand intact and really resource the team to continue doing what we were doing. Mm -hmm. Whereas a lot of other acquirers wanted to chop us up for parts. Uh, and so that was uh, that was the litmus test number two, and then um, and then number three was um, for the customers. We just felt like the ultimate goal for our customers showcasing their work on Behance, their creative work, where you know these are all commercial creatives, millions around the world, was to get attribution for the work that they did. And we realized that integrating that into the tools they actually used to create was the kind of holy grail for that. And we realized Adobe would be the perfect partner. So with those three boxes checked. We, uh, we move forward. But I would say that it's the unicorn. You know, a lot of people talk about the $1 billion plus valuation unicorns. I think it's much more rare for an acquisition to go so well and for the team to stay intact for so many years. Well, that's fantastic. So I didn't realize you only, you did your Series A, six and a half million, as I understand, with some notable investors of Jeff Bezos and Union Square Ventures. And that was only two years before you sold. So they must have had a nice multiple. They did. I think it was even less, a little less than two years. They had a great... Uh, great return from a time perspective, that's for sure. <laughs> Fabulous. So, so you spend time after, at Adobe after you sell. Then you leave Adobe, as I understand, to write, invest, join Benchmark as a general partner, only to return labor, uh, later as Adobe's chief product officer. So take us through that journey. 
Well, it had been, it had been three years at Adobe post acquisition and therefore 10 years since the beginning of Behance. So I felt like with this decade of passionate obsession around, uh, around building things for creative people, I should probably try to do something else. And I would say I made a big career mistake, which was I really believed that when everyone tells you you should do something, that means that you should do it. Right. And they, they probably know you better than yourself. Everyone was telling me, all my friends and people that I um, worked with, that, oh, you should be an investor. Mm -hmm. I had some, uh, some successful seed investments that were really just me working with other product leaders, helping them with their products, taking the opportunity to invest in their seed round, and then a number of these companies that actually materialized and worked out. And, uh, and so that suddenly became a, oh, you should be an investor type of message. Right. And I thought, I should probably have my hand at it. I feel like there are too many finance-driven investors, and as a lot of uh, viewers of this know, um, it's oftentimes helpful to have an operator as an investor, and especially in my world of consumer products and you know, having someone who really understands the nuances of crafting a product and bringing it to market is a really helpful investor to have. So I went all in and uh, joined, uh, joined Benchmark, again, without having much resolution, even around the differences between these VC firms, right. their cultures, the stages that they operate in. And to, suffice to say, I knew pretty quickly that this is not what I wanted to do for the next 15 years of my life. I miss building, I miss building teams and operating and crafting product experiences and uh, did not love the life as a, as a partner uh, you know, at a big a venture capital firm. So I had to extract myself, maintaining those relationships, you know, became a venture partner, it took some time to write this book, The Messy Middle, and, and figure out what I was gonna do next. Yeah, oh, fantastic. I, I've seen that journey a few times for folks who get into investing. And when you're as an operator, you're so used to getting to work once the capital comes in, it's, you're kind of done at that point many times as an investor. So it's kind of a different business model. Yeah, that's true. So, you know, you jump back into Adobe and now you have this large team and $150 billion company. Was there a massive temptation to just go rogue, create the skunk works to get things done rather than drive the difficult process of organizational behavior? It was a bit, it was a, um, a bit of a masochistic desire for me to go back into a big company and, uh, you know, and try to innovate within the, you know, the, the realities of a large public company with a lot of, you know, deep institutional knowledge and baggage. Hmm. But I loved the idea of leading change. It's always been something interesting to me. I also had a lot of relationships in the company, right? Uh, you know, including a relationship with Shantanu, our CEO, you know, who ultimately brought me back um, after leaving. You know, uh, and uh, I just felt like what an opportunity. I feel like I have a job here to do, and I feel like I'm the best to do it. So. That was, uh, and, and what I have tried to do is bifurcate kind of my approach in the company. Half of it is I'm trying to be respectful of organizational boundaries. I'm trying to be a steward of a very established product. You know, you, some of these products are billion dollar businesses in and of themselves. And, uh, and really, uh, you know, become an executive in that way. Right. And then there's another side of me as being the brash, you know, rogue, uh, you know, argumentative uh, entrepreneur who's saying, what the heck, how can we not do that? Why is this taking so long? Who says you can't do that? Let me get them on the phone, uh, trying to bring a dose of that as well. And it's been a fun kind of uh, you know, thing to play. And you know, where does my heart lie? But, uh, but it's, been, it's been a really fun journey. Now, now I'm two, uh, two years or so into, uh, into that new gig. You know, in the, in the last few years as a consumer of Adobe products, I've noticed there's been a huge shift in product. Uh, with an emphatic focus on mobile and simplicity. I suspect a bit of that was your initiative. Yeah, so when I was, when I was here uh, at Adobe, in my first tenure, after one year of being acquired, and this goes back to your question about you know, why I stuck around, uh, I was asked to take on the mobile uh, effort, which was nothing at the time. Mm. And, uh, and that was really exciting to me. And in fact, that kind of reinvigorated me in the company and made me move beyond just Behance, which was my product. Mm -hmm. uh, to, to work across the organization to launch a mobile strategy that had them, you know, had these products connected in the cloud so they could actually work with the desktop products and, and build a strategy that is actually the legs that we stand on today as we launch products like Photoshop on iPad and other things like that. So it has in some ways been a five-year journey. Also, while I was at Adobe in my previous tenure, I restarted our relationship with Apple with some colleagues I had over there. And at the time, we were still coming out of that world where Apple and Adobe had fought about Flash and, you know, uh, 
had as many foes as they had friends, you know, between the companies. So it was, uh, it's, it's rewarding to kind of come back and try to shift some of the vision we had many years ago. Um, and so that is, that has been part of the, part of the job description. You know, I can imagine, you know, so when you jump into this, you go from entrepreneurial led, uh, you know, moved by the seat of your pants kind of management style, I would assume to some extent, did you discover any blind spots along the way in your skill set or management style that had to be adjusted for the big company? Or did you already have all those filled up from Goldman Sachs? <laughs> no, I had a lot of, and still have a number of blind spots. I, mean, I think even, even just recently, you know, I was given the feedback through my uh, head of HR that, um, that you know, some people on my team are sometimes wondering, you know, why am I, why am I going past them to specific engineers and product leaders in the organization to mm -hmm. get, to get answers, you know, and that's just, my personality, first of all, is I love working shoulder to shoulder with product leaders and designers. When right. I build those relationships, I like to go to the source as opposed to play a game of operator. Yeah. And so I see that as efficiency. And yet, at the same time, I am, uh, and, I, and part of also this new technology we use to communicate, we're using Slack now, which right. is kind of a drop an instant message as opposed to an email, you just CC their manager and it's no problem. Mm -hmm. But when, you, uh, when you're not including the you know, the VP in my case, in the chain of communications, then you are in a sense cutting people out. And if I can imagine how they feel, they're like, well, mm. you know, Scott's going to my people directly. What, are, what is he asking? Why isn't he coming to me? Is my future in jeopardy? You know, it's an interesting um, alternative perspective, you know, on that behavior. And so I, I realized you know, it's a bit of a blind spot in terms of how my, my, my staff of vice presidents feel and, um, you know, and how I should really make sure I get things done in an organization in a scalable fashion. It's somewhat respectful of boundaries and organizational right. norms. It's uh, that's the kind of stuff I think I'm still learning to some extent, but also trying to push the edges of. And my my answer to that is not to just do it the company way, but have a conversation. You know, I want to have an offsite with my staff uh, or a conversation at our upcoming offsite where I say, "This is my tendency." You know, let's talk about it. Like, how does this work? Not work? What do you want me to do differently? Um, you know, let's see if we can evolve. You know, it's interesting. We don't always think about how some of these new tools or techniques or communication devices such as Slack uh, creates a, a change in the culture or how people communicate and the impact of that. So it's, it's kind of interesting to, uh, to consider. So, yeah. you know, you, your direction kind of came from design. I know everything you've done comes from a design perspective, which is probably different than a lot of folks in YPO. Do you think that's given you an edge in your career? You know, I like to say sometimes that design is my cheat in some ways for alignment. Uh, if you look at any organization and you're trying to get everyone aligned, it's really easy when you have three or four people around a table that are all brought to the cause for the right reason and all have, a, all have um, equal or, a, or a, a meaningful stake in the game. But when you start to scale and you have many people and functions and geographies and incentives and compensation frameworks and everything else, you obviously get a lot of misalignment around what right. the actual mission is, what needs to be accomplished and why prioritization and, uh, and how do you solve misalignment? I mean, there's really two ways, right? One is to throw process at the problem and then you become a big, slow company with tons of processes that try to keep people desperately aligned or you try to use storytelling and showing rather than telling to get people aligned. And my trick has always been to use prototypes. I feel like a prototype is worth a thousand meetings. If you're trying to convince people of a major product change with huge business implications and a drastic change in customer experience and expectations, if we talk about it at a meeting, we could talk forever and still disagree. And half the people are probably thinking something that, I'm, that is different than what I'm saying. But if I just show a prototype, a high fidelity, walk through step-by-step -step experience mm. that we can all empathize as customers with, it's so much easier to get people aligned. But it's easier said than done. You have to front load the design work in the system. You have to really empower designers, have a seat at the table. You have to recruit the right people. You have to change the organization so that product leaders allow designers to do this exploration mm. before it's even vetted. There's a lot of things you have to do to accomplish that. Hmm. Interesting. You know, in, if you could push the redo button, maybe, once in Behance and once in Adobe, what, what would those things be? What, what, what are those moments in time you'd hit the redo button on? Well, for Behance, it would certainly be doing fewer things. I think that the moments where Behance really started to hit a new groove were when we killed initiatives or features. Mm -hmm. And why did those things materialize in the first place? 
truthfully, it's probably because I was always trying to hedge ourselves. I never knew what feature would be the most important feature. I never knew what business would be the most important business. And so I would, as a young entrepreneur new to this, I would say, let's just do both and see what works. And of course, at that moment, not only am I splitting the effort of the team across multiple initiatives and they all happen at a lower velocity and potentially lower quality, but I also split the choices for our customers. And in the product, when we offered customers multiple ways to engage and to present their work and to connect with each other, we would just have much less engagement on each of them. And then when we realized years later, probably than we should have, that when you remove a few of those things, everyone just does the core thing more, um, it's like it, the light went on. And mm -hmm. suddenly I went on this killing spree. <laughs> um, and so I think that you know now it's the, it's the mantra of simplicity and focus and, um, you know, and doing one thing extraordinarily well that I try to apply to counter my tendencies to hedge and make sure we have uh, you know, a dog in the race. You know, for a guy in the creative space, you talk a lot in your books and otherwise about killing ideas. So I know I, I want to dig into that a little bit more. I know it's about focus. So your, your two books, The Making Things Happen and The Messy Middle, to be honest, are some of the best books I've read. Not just because I'm interviewing you today, but in particular, I really like your writing style and the theme on execution. And the fact, the fact that you got these written and published itself speaks about your ability to execute. So, you know, maybe starting with your, your first book, Making Things Happen, you espouse a relentless bias towards action and describe everything as a project. Tell me a bit more about that perspective. Yeah, well, uh, I, the, the framework was really around how do we help people, um, how do we help people who have more creativity than they know what to do with, uh, challenge, them, challenge themselves to stop being more creative and start being more action oriented. And I just feel like in some ways there's, you know, what I like to call the creatives compromise, this notion that a creative individual or team must compromise an aspect of their very essence in order to be productive, okay. which is hard because, uh, but it's true. I, I think that the, uh, the, the, the problem in the creative world is that there's just um, this, this love of creative idea generation and that is, um, intoxicating and you oftentimes need that sober monitor or that designated driver that counterpart that kind of keeps you organized and focused and, and what have you so I think in some ways I've always struggled with that myself and I've tried to be both the dreamer and the doer and to rotate between the two which is probably why my mistake oftentimes is having too many things that are actually executed and then you know and then having to kill some of them mm. um, but uh but it was interesting to me. I mean, the, 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 the goal of that book was to find out why some of the most productive or how some of the most productive creative individuals and teams in the world mm. operate. You know, why is it that they make so many ideas happen, whereas most of us cannot? And a lot of it was about community forces like accountability and feedback from sharing your ideas liberally before they're actually ready to be shared. Um, some of it was around organization principles like a life and projects and, and how to how to use processes like what I like to call Darwinian prioritization, otherwise known as nagging, to have other people remind you of what you should be doing and harness that force and um, mm. uh, and and the leadership principles around getting a creative team to be more execution focused. And a lot of that nagging I understand you do through transparency. And that's by kind of sharing what you're working on, what other people are working on to make sure that everybody agrees. Yeah, it's that and it's also a, um, a culture where people can just have ambient um, roles and reminding each other of the things that are priorities and, um, and leveraging that as opposed to feeling like it's disorder. Um, a lot of, I mean, a perfect example is meetings. And we always go into meetings with an agenda. And an agenda is oftentimes tasked to somebody is to pull agenda topics from everyone participating in that meeting. And so people feel like they have to respond to them. And so people come up with agenda topics to discuss. And then we all get into a meeting discussing an agenda that may not at all be what's on top of people's minds or from a Darwinian prioritization perspective should be discussed. And um, one of the things I actually liked about the, the system we use at Benchmark for partner meetings was that there was never any agenda. And so people would go into a room for an entire day and just start talking about whatever, whatever was top of mind. Hmm. And if no one ever talked about blockchain, that tells you something. Right, right. You know, even though everyone else is. It's like, well, if it's not something we're thinking about and we trust our own intuition, uh, then let's not talk about it. Makes sense. You know, and I'll, and I'll espouse the fact that 
I don't think it's just a problem that creatives have. I know in every business, when it comes to project management or execution, one of the things I loved, you said in, in your book that removing the tendency to escape lulls of the project plateau by developing new ideas to reinvigorate that excitement. And I, I can resonate quite personally with that and, uh, and actually struggle with that myself. Yes. I mean, it's, uh, it's a, that, that is the creative's tendency that tends to uh, obstruct any progress is when we get lost in the realities of life and project execution. It's so tempting to just jump onto a new and exciting idea, new shiny object. And, uh, you know, of course, as leaders of creative teams, we're trying to uh, keep, keep that. We're trying to kill most ideas, you know, back to your point. It's, um, I've come to liken it to an immune system. I feel like every team and society as a whole needs an immune system that kills off ideas as soon as they come up just to keep us on track, to keep the water running, to keep the right. company delivering on a quarterly cadence. Now, of course, every now and then, hopefully not often, you may need an organ transplant. And the first thing the doctor does is the doctor suppresses your immune system so new organ can take hold and change literally who you are. And I think that's what we have to do in teams is we have to identify the moments when it's time for an organ transplant, we have to sort of, um, we have to kind of suppress the immune system, those doers, the project managers, those leaders who are operations focused and empower the dreamers to take hold and change us. But that shouldn't be, you know, more than 5% of the time. Did you feel the onset of the white blood cells getting you at Adobe at any point in, in, in either your first iteration or your second? Yeah, all the time. And, but it's, I think part of what, you know, and I tell this to our designers and our, you know, creative leaders often is that it's, this is, this is the company's immune system keeping us on track. And in fact, if a idea can't survive the immune system, it shouldn't. I mean, that's the point, right? Is that you don't want um, the common virus to take, take over your body uh, unless it's, unless it's something that you're trying to do surgically. So I think that's the idea and it's okay. You know, it's okay to let ideas die and to kill them. It's part of the cycle. You just have to be selective. And then when you believe something is right, just have to, you know, see if it can overcome. You know, so you talk a lot about culture and an example you had is of the done wall, of the list of all the tasks that have been accomplished in the past. Tell me the significance of that. Well, the significance of that dates back to some research that I did with a professor at Harvard Business School named Teresa Mabale when I was a student there. And she did this study around diaries and organizations and, um, and, 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 and she was trying to understand the, um, the rhythms of creativity within organizations and, and motivation in the correlations between these things. And one thing that she found in this study of thousands of people diarying for a period of time and then um, reporting like their level of motivation based on progress and, and achievements and that sort of thing was that progress begets progress. This sort of chicken and egg issue of mm. when you feel like you're making progress, you make more progress. But when you don't feel like you're making progress, you actually become demotivated, less organized, and you stop making progress. I got you. Well, how do, how do we translate that to a small company or an entrepreneurial you know, endeavor where you know, progress is very hard to see, it's hard to measure at times. Um, and so I think it's about merchandising progress. And I got really carried with this idea of why don't we use the same tools that advertising firms use to get us to take action and believe in things publicly? You know, why don't we use those same tools to get us to believe in things internally? You know, as a, as a team, why aren't we merchandising the progress that we're making to each other to get more progress out of each other? And that was one of those experiments that we did at Behance that became very moving to us was whenever we were tracking and completing major things, we had like ways of tracking them. We would print them out or just use marker and then put them on this done wall as a testament to the progress that we were making. Uh, and it was very powerful. That's great. And, you know, you espousing this to kind of productizing these things is, is really one of the things I found most fun to read in your book, especially when we shift over to the messy middle on, on the examples you give and these analogies that are, that are really quite clear and, and straight on. So I, like I, one of the things I loved is your table of contents, for example, that you give statements rather than topics. Like one of them was attribute the right amount of credit to the right people rather than perhaps, you know, leadership and management style. What kind of drove you to that kind of non-traditional format for the book when you're crafting it? Yeah, no, no one's asked me that yet, but it was actually quite a fight with our publisher because, uh, you know, my, my view on the messy middle 
was a more pragmatic, I don't think a lot of my audience has time to read business books and they don't want to read a single business book about a topic, you know, that's told 10 times in different ways, mm. different stories. I wanted to write a more, um, to, you know, kind of bulleted action driven hundred insights type book where, right. uh, because in, in my experience, and I'm sure you've experienced this as well, some of the most powerful conversations you have with colleagues or mentors or, you know, people who give you advice are quick five, 10 minute check-ins. Mm. Um, for me, it was with an entrepreneur at like one in the morning about whether he or she should sell their company or do this or that. And it was quickly like a five or 10 minute chat where I would try to, and people do this for me as well, impart a few things that just stuck in my head um, as lenses for the decision that I was making. And so the thought was, if I captured those moments that I had and others had with me and I had on boards and that sort of thing, and also that I heard from others, and I just had 100 or 150 of them, and then just kind of compartmentalized each and gave people an index in the beginning to see which ones resonate, that that could be the equivalent of, you know, 100 to 150 calls on demand that you would want to have for a particular issue. And so that was the, that was the idea. Of course, the publisher um, at Penguin was like, what is this? Do you need help assembling? Right. Right. And I, had to, uh, I, had to I found it one of the best part of the parts of the book. It certainly enjoyed that as it went through. And like you say, it's a really easy way to find the nuggets in that conversation. So you know, what does it mean to be all about product? Yeah, I think that, well, I mean, these days, most companies should be all about product. I mean, a product at the end of the day is what is the product or service that you're delivering, the experience you're delivering to customers. And it has to do with everything from the first mile of a customer's experience of it. You know, what gets them through that first mile, whether it's the splash page, the get started button, the onboarding, the leave your phone number, the email, whatever it is for your customer, or walking into the store, you know, what's the, what, the window, whatever's in the window in right. some ways is the first mile of the customer's experience coming in the door. And what's interesting to me and completely opposite of the way it should be is that oftentimes the last mile of the team's experience building the product is dedicated to developing the first mile of the customer's experience using the product. And yet the only part of the product that every customer sees is the first mile. Yeah. So, you know, you might as well spend the majority of your time on that first mile just to get people down the funnel enough to the point where they can discover the value of your product. Mm -hmm. uh, in some ways, it's inverted. And so I think that being a product driven leader is recognizing you know, certain truths and principles like that and in incorporating them into how you prioritize, how you allocate resources. Um, you know, every decision, as I'm learning now, even in this executive role at Adobe, um, can be influenced from a product centric point of view. It also of course means being driven by the empathy with the customer suffering the problem you're solving. And, and that's a, another ethos I think of a product minded leader. Interesting. So, you know, probably 20 to 30% of YPOers are somewhere in the messy middle. Mm -hmm. And it might be with a third startup. It might be with a family business. They're transitioning. It might be anything. So if they haven't picked up your book yet, you know, what are some points or topics you might, highlight as they go through the journey? Well, I think a few things, you know, I, I would say that overarching, you know, the book is split into three parts, how to endure those lows, um, how to optimize those highs, and then how to not screw up the final mile um, of, a, of a venture um, or a turnaround or a project, whatever it is you're working on. On the endurance side, you know, there's a, there's, um, a lot of thoughts on that front. I mean, I guess one I would impart is really around the reward system that we are all kind of deeply indoctrinated with that governs our work and feeling of achievement, you know, in any of these tough moments of a, of a, of a, of a business. Um, and, uh, and I think that uh, it's fair to say we're all deeply, you know, short-term reward oriented. We need to see those metrics. We need to see those dollars. We, I think there was a, uh, Fred Wilson from Unisquare Ventures said at one of the conferences we did years ago that the two greatest addictions in life are heroin and a weekly salary. And this, you know, this notion of having to unplug yourself from the, the dopamine drip of knowing that you're doing well, whether it's a bonus or, you know, income at the door. But if you're in a messy middle, oftentimes you're not getting the feedback that you would need to know you're on the right track. And so then the question is, how do you keep the team engaged long enough? I mean, what if the dirty little secret is that the best startups or the best companies are succeed simply because they stick together long enough to figure it out? Mm. And if that's the case... Um, 
and, and you, yeah, of course you can get people to join something based on a long-term vision for a long-term reward, but day to day, it's not going to work. It's not going to do the trick. And so I actually think you have to short circuit the way the team works um, to have those short-term rewards, even when there aren't any formal ones, whether it be fun little games you play, um, milestones that you celebrate as a team that may not be interesting to investors, but are right. interesting to the team, indicative of progress, um, all sorts of fun little ones. You know, we had many, you know, along the course of Behance that, um, you know, kept us engaged when, when, when days were dark. Yeah, what's one that sticks out, oh, resonates in yeah. your mind? Well, like two very quick snippets. You know, one is I've been a vegetarian now for 28 years. And, but at the time the team thought it'd be really funny to get me to agree that if we reached 100,000 members that I would have to eat meat off of one of our developers' forks. <laughs> so of course I said, sure, you know, whatever that happens, right. you know, if that happens, and yet, let, let alone, you know, lo and behold, two, two years later at a Christmas dinner, I was eating chicken off of Dave, Dave's fork. Um, another one, which is really funny, is that um, Behance was a made up word. And so whenever we would type Behance into Google, it always said, do you mean enhance? Do you mean enhance? Right. It was really frustrating back in 2006, I can imagine you know, to be a mistake. And so we figured, hey, before we talk about revenue and members, let's just try to not be a mistake anymore. And so it, it, it incentivized the right behaviors. It got us to hustle, to get link backs across the web and to get more people to build portfolios. And, and then one day, six months later, Behance was the legitimate search term. No more autocorrect. <laughs> no more autocorrect. And then, I kid you not, early 2008, Beyonce became super popular. Yeah, and back to autocorrect, huh? <laughs> That's great. So, you know, talk a little bit about writing the book. I mean, it's not a trite thing. So all of these things you came up with, say, focusing on the messy middle at this point. Now, were these little truisms you're keeping on sticky notes for 10 years? Is this just, all right, sit down in the forest and plow through and create the timeline? Tell me about your process. Yeah, no, it was, it was about seven years of, um, of, of, of scribbling things down. So um, Making Ideas Happen came out in 2010. You know, I started to then, whenever I had things that I wanted to remember, I, I started a little notebook and eventually that notebook became an Evernote notebook of notes mm. uh, and, the, and the title was Essential Realizations because I didn't know what the theme was yet. But these right. were all like realizations that I had that I thought would be essential for me to remember um, and maybe for me to share at some point in the right forum. And so that kind of continued for uh, five, six years uh, until I had over six or 700 notes um, of these like one one liners and then some some sort of topic or context or story and uh, And so I took it upon myself at one point to do this project actually when I left full-time investing and had some time or actually right before you no, know, right when I left Adobe um, before being an investor I started this project and um, And I started to realize that there, there was a theme, you know, they were either all about endurance You know those low points. They were always about or they were about optimizing whatever the heck was working and how a team works and how a product works, um, or they were about kind of the end and how to make sure you didn't uh, you didn't self sabotage when things started to actually come together and work. Started to work, and, and there is a lot to be said for being the last man standing on endurance. I think as you yeah, no, I think so. And and there were, and I read some fun you know resource books just about you know whether it was the Shackleton adventure you know of uh, yeah. or other other sort of stories of endurance to better better you know figure out tips and tips and insights that could be uh, interesting to others any particular books you've read stand out to you oh goodness oh, um quite a few i mean i um i uh i like the sebastian junger book tribe recently um mm -hmm. and uh you know that's really about kind of the the role of adversity in bringing teams together and um and kind of how to leverage it as opposed to you know bury it and move on um, I really liked that, that book about, um, about kind of Pixar's kind of culture and approach to creativity. I thought, I think it was called Creativity Inc. It was really interesting. Um, and, uh, yeah, those are, those were a couple recently. Um, and I recently am in this, you know, Ted book club, so I've been getting more books on my Kindle and I typically hop around, you know, skimming, uh, I was reading the Sapiens, I think it's called the Sapiens yeah. book recently. And it was interesting. Just the origin origin of creativity and how it's kind of you know back to like the difference between us and the predecessors of the Neanderthals and like the way the brains work with imagination. I, I love little bits and pieces and connecting them to you know my present life and things I'm thinking about. You know, you know, so as I shift to maybe a bit of your investing, 
I understand you're in almost 50 early stage investments from Airtable to Uber. And I, I assume you started that predominantly after your liquidity event. Tell me a bit about what you look for. Well, A, obviously you enjoy it. You, you like being involved in early stage, of course. And what do you look for in these investments? How are you find, How are you getting deal flow? What sort of projects do you like? Well, a number of these investments, again, started as relationships with other founders who are product-oriented founders who asked for um, advice on their products. And I mean, Pinterest, which was my first investment back in 2010, Ben Silberman was another product-oriented founder, and he asked if I would be a product advisor. And then when he was raising his seed round, he said, would you like to participate? It was actually before the exit. So I had probably no business um, investing in another company with the salary I was making. But in some ways, I wanted to buy an education. And he was a West Coast entrepreneur who had come from Google. And I was an East Coast entrepreneur who had had this tint at Goldman Sachs that I never talked about. So I figured, uh, you know, it was, if, it was, if I lost the money, it would at least be something that I would learn from. Right. And, um, you know, and that led to another series of fortuitous collaborations and investments in um, other early stage companies. Um, now, of course, it's, it's, um, it's, a, it's a network of alumni to some extent of the companies that I've worked with over the years or companies that they join. And, uh, and I think once you have a number of these investments under your belt um, and you're talking to them, of course, also the books and things like that, you know, help, help me uh, get to meet all kinds of entrepreneurs doing interesting right. things. And I just try to look at the, um, I look at whether there are threads that I want to help them pull. I mean, that's certainly a litmus test. Whether there are products that I really resonate with and, and I want to participate in. Mm. Um, and, uh, and, you know, of course, it's always about the people. So the successes speak for themselves. So what was like the biggest crash and burn investment you went into? And, and what did you, what did you, when you analyzed it in postmortem, was there a misread or, or where do you think the mistake was? Yeah, I mean, there were obviously several companies that went completely bust, which, um, you know, with the ones where they were great entrepreneurs and I admired the way that they wound down the company. In some cases, I've invested in their second company already. So, sure. um, but there are some where I felt like such an idiot, you know, doing because I looked in back and I saw some signs. I mean, there was one, for example, by, um, uh, you know, someone who was a alum of my same college. So, you know, I kind of, that's how he reached out to me. And in that first call, he kept name dropping, like, a, you know, this in, in almost like a very drip, insecure way. You know, this person said, this is my product. And this person is, said he'll invest in this person. And, and it just struck me as, you know, why is that what you're leading with? And it just, I remember it threw me off, but then I kind of looked past it. I liked the idea you know, I liked a couple of people that were working for him. And, uh, and then the whole journey was like this, you know, he just always overstepped. He always, you know, did blind intros without asking me. I mean, everything in the book that right. you get annoyed by and feel is just someone who doesn't have a very good sense of self-awareness and, and um, you know, it just was a very consistent thing. And so of course that's why the business failed, or at least, you know, that was a headwind and, I should have known. Uh, so those are the types of things you learn from individual stories. And, and I try to do postmortems for myself and, you know, why something didn't work out and, uh, and what I learned from it. You know, do you do anything in crypto? Do you get involved in blockchain at all? I've done a few, um, a few investments in that space um, that are, you know, one, for example, is a company called Brain Trust, which is um, attacking the freelancer marketplace problem, but from a blockchain, blockchain kind of token driven approach that doesn't require you to take a take rate of every transaction, because I actually think that's one of the fatal mm -hmm. flaws of any freelancer marketplace is that there's always a platform that's just raking a percentage of the revenue. Right. And there's always therefore an incentive to take it offline. Whereas if you're not if that's not happening, in fact, if you're incentivized to introduce other freelancers to work with you on the project and the tokens that you get, you know, it escalate in value based on the integrity of the network and how many people are getting more business, you know, then in some ways you're a participant in an economy. And as opposed to trying to get the work off the platform, you want to get more work on the platform. And mm -hmm. so that's like one example, you know, of, uh, of, and there's been a few that I am exploring or have invested in. So what do you think of the gig economy in general? So this, this transition of virtual company, I mean, you know, one of the things I chat with many YPOers about is it wasn't long ago 
when you sat around the cocktail party, the impressive figure would be how many employees do you have, right? And now when someone tells me how many employees they have, I almost feel like apologizing, like, oh God, I'm, you know, I'm sorry. You know, I'm sorry to hear you have so many. Uh, where do you see the future of this kind of work? Do you think we're really gonna shift to many, many more virtual teams or do you think it's a bit of a fad, you know, kind of like the explosion we had with WeWork? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. I really think there's actually two sides of the spectrum that will each be very compelling for different reasons. I think that at the end of the, at the, end of the day, customer service and, um, you know, and the art of the business as opposed to the science of the business, mm -hmm. the science of business is scaling, the art of the business is the things that don't scale. And, um, and that's actually oftentimes what differentiates a lot of brands and players in market. It's the little things that they do. It's the cookie behind the double tree counter, or it's the, you know, the photograph that Airbnb commissions of all their top properties from a well-known photographer. It's, these are the, you know, these are the art elements that, um, that are not intended to scale. Uh, but on the, but of course, you know, there is, there's this desire for efficiency. I mean, the freelancers union estimates that over 40% of the American workforce will be independent professionals by next year, by the end of next year. Hmm. And what are the implications of this? There's all new technologies that we need for remote work that are obviously being built now. And there's tons of great players in that space. There is also back office type of offerings that can enable anyone to have the benefits of being a, in a firm. I mean, if you think about this era of the firm, joining a law firm, an accounting firm, any of these, uh, joining a salon as a hair cutter, like this idea of joining an agency, joining a firm, is a completely antiquated one. The reason you did it is because you were benefiting for them from their brand, which you can now build and grow and scale for nothing on social media. You were joining them for their back office technologies like billing and payments and taxes and all of that stuff can be done for $12 a month as a right. service, right? And so now that you're starting to check off all the boxes, I think we'll start to see more independent professionals, even maybe upstream like lawyers and accountants you know, work on their own, have the benefits of doing so, and still have partners that work together in other ways. So you get the benefits of the firm from a partnership perspective and, uh, you know, and sharing business and that type of thing, again, without the overhead. So I actually am very excited about the economy. I don't think that it's all about turning everyone into um, contractors. And, right. you know, I actually think the government will start to kick in on some of that stuff. And I also think that, um, you know, there will be, the laws of economics. I mean, at the end of the day, at the end of the day, these people are people, and they command people. They command power as a group. So, I think that some of that stuff will come to equilibrium. But it's um, but it's an exciting future overall for the independent workforce. You know, do you think other than the new startups and companies in Silicon Valley could could a company like Adobe do that one day and create these almost film like project teams to attack a particular product or something development, disband them, and and, and run in that way? Or do you think this is really just something for the startups. Um, and you mean like for our own workers or for yeah, uh, something like within Adobe, could Adobe take that shift from all these full-time employees and take 20, 30% of them over the next X amount of years and have these transient teams? Well, that's a good question because we talk about it sometimes internal, internal about, you know, whether, what is our tolerance for remote as a, you know, as a, as a strategy and to get talent wherever they may be and to, you know, to uh, just scale the way that we work. Um, I think one of the problems though is, is we're a culture where so much of our decision making is centralized, and um, and it's it, the question I also sometimes I sometimes have is does it have to be all or nothing? Like, do you have to be a remote company to really do this right, um, or is there a halfway point? Like, can half the people be in major headquarters, you know, working one way, and the other half can be working another way? Um, sometimes, in some in my experience, that can cause like an out of sight, out of mind um, problem. And it can get in the way of people's career trajectories. Um, and when it comes to like accountability, you know, and how you are measuring people, you need to adopt modern techniques and technologies to have a productive work environment if you're a remote company. And I think at Adobe, we have started adopting a lot of new technologies. Um, but, you know, I don't think we are as advanced on that front as, say, like a brand new startup that is starting up completely 100% remote mm -hmm. and has like these daily rhythms that everyone is running by that measure um, productivity. Yeah, it's a little tough to mix sometimes. It is. So you've got a big birthday coming up in April. <laughs> yeah. the, big, the big four zero. Uh, 
have you always had a life family work balance or is this something you've gotten a bit better at or worse at? I'm not sure over time. Well, it's something I, I want to become better at. It's something I think about a lot these days with my travel back and forth between the East Coast and the West Coast. And you have a couple of young kids, yeah? Yeah, and I have three young kids. So um, I think it's, a, you know, it's, a, it's one of those things where it's a constant struggle and yet I think that the fact that it's a struggle is means I'm okay with it. Like if I weren't struggling, that would mean I'm not, there's right. no friction and I'm not facing it. Um, the fact that it's constantly a conversation, you know, with my wife, Erica around, you know, is this working or how much, you know, so what would Erica say if she was in the room right now and said, you know, Scott's life work balance over the last 10 years. No, I think we, I think she would say that it's, you know, it's, it's not, it's definitely not balanced at every moment in time, but we're trying to achieve a sense of balance over time and that there've been periods where we have, and there've been periods where we haven't. I, I think that's a fair guess where she would where she would would land and um um and so we'll see i mean i think that it's it's worked you know for the last few years and uh um i think though you know getting into my 40s i'll have to you know maybe we'll have to move to another coast maybe we'll have to uh you know rethink the arrangement but day by day uh uh it, things seem to be things seem to be working fantastic well look I, i've certainly enjoyed having this chat today i appreciate the time spending to uh chat with YPOers. Uh, I hope we're gonna get this chance to see you in YPO. Thank you. I mean, listen, everything I've learned about the organization, um, you know, makes me realize how much I have to learn uh, and, um, you know, and how much I would benefit from these tough questions, you know, uh, being asked me probably more often. So thanks for my, uh, thanks for my dose today. Mm -hmm.